Welcome to the International Childbirth Initiative webinar series on the 12 steps to safe and respectful mother baby family maternity care. My name is Michelle Skiratharian and I'm the executive director of the International Childbirth Initiative. The International Childbirth Initiative is an implementation and quality improvement process that strives to achieve the 12 steps for safe and respectful mother baby family maternity care through a self-evaluative and reflective process that is conducted at the facility level. ICI is also a global resource network of facilities striving to share their learning and improve the provision of care. It was created through the joint effort of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics and the International Mother Baby Childbirth Organization. It includes 20 partner organizations and continues to grow. ICI is open to all birthing facilities who are willing to commit to delivering safe and respectful mother baby family maternity care. Today's webinar is on step one, treat every woman and newborn with compassion, respect, and dignity. Our presenter is Elena Ativa from the White Ribbon Alliance. Elena is the advocacy manager at White Ribbon Alliance, as well as the maternal health lead for the USAID Health Policy Plus project. She is an attorney and a human rights advocate whose work focuses on the prevention of all forms of violence against women around the world. We're very pleased to have with us today, Elena. Thank you for the introduction, Michelle, and I'm very happy to be here. Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure today to present step one of the ICI initiative and, and really a, a passion of mine. Um, first, I would like to say a few words about the White Ribbon Alliance for those of you who might not be familiar. White Ribbon Alliance is a global advocacy movement for reproductive, maternal, and newborn health and rights. It's comprised of a vast network of affiliated alliances, networks, coalitions, and individuals. Basically, everybody who is a stakeholder in reproductive, maternal, and newborn health care globally. Today's step um, really focuses on treating every woman and newborn with respect and dignity, fully informing and communicating with the woman and her family in decision-making about care for herself and her baby in a way that's culturally safe and sensitive, ensuring her right to inform consent and refusal. Step one incorporates a rights-based approach. Um, it focuses on preventing exclusion and maltreatment of the marginalized and socioeconomically disadvantaged, and including protection of HIV positive women and women who experience perinatal loss. Under no circumstances is physical, verbal, or emotional abuse of women, their newborns, or their families ever allowed. I would like first to talk a little bit about what respect and dignity means and who should define it. And I would like to start by introducing uh, an initiative that White Ribbon Line started in 2018. We launched a global campaign called What Women Want. We basically asked women one basic question. What do you want for your own reproductive maternal care? And we received responses from more than 1.2 million women from around the world. Women from high-income countries, middle-income countries, low-income countries. Everybody participated and responded their number one request was respect and dignity. So this is really top of mind for women and girls from around the world. And in this and the next several slides, I want to show you what that means to them. How do they define respect? For example, for Mutesi, who's 18 and from Uganda, that means total respect for my body. For Naindansi from Malawi, that means to cherish and care for me. And for Swasti from Nepal, it means respectful behavior from health professionals. All of these responses, you can check for yourself. You can uh, go to the White Tribune Alliance website and look at the What We Want dashboard. Uh, where you can see every single response in an anonymized manner, but you can, you can search by country, you can search by the type of response, you can compare and contrast if you want to check out, you know, what women in Kenya are saying versus women in Nepal, you can do that. Or if you're 
particularly interested in a, in a topic um, such as antenatal care, labor and delivery, postnatal care, facilities, et cetera, you can do that and you can search um, the responses and you can see the actual responses for yourself. Now, White Tribune Alliance has worked for a number of years um, defining uh, and explaining the universal rights of women and newborns, but this campaign really brought new resolve to our efforts. In 2019, we released an updated Respectful Maternity Care Charter. That is a charter that um, is based on universally accepted human rights instruments and basically details what are the rights of women and their newborns. We did that um, by bringing together uh, individuals from different organizations, some of those uh, here listed on the slide, and um, wanted to create a consensus document, um, a wording that everybody is in agreement with would be helpful because the individual human rights documents that this treasury is based on are a very technical, very legal documents and, and very often harder to understand for the general public. We wanted to make sure that this document takes into account the growing recognition that the rights of the woman and the newborn need to be well articulated to ensure that both are cared for with respect and dignity. Their rights are linked and they need to be cared for together to benefit both of them. The updated charter um, incorporates in more detail the rights of the newborn, something that maybe was not articulated as well before. So specific rights that apply to the newborn only, such as a right to a name and nationality, right not to be separated from their parents and the right to nutrition and clean environment for the newborn are um, better articulated in the new charter. And as I previously mentioned, the charter is based on widely accepted human rights standards. Um, these are, for example, global um, documents that every country, almost every country in the world can side on to, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, as well as regional documents that apply to specific regions of the world and further articulate or provide guidance on specific rights. And some examples are the European Convention on Human Rights in Biomedicine, the African Charter on Human Rights and People's Rights, and the American Convention on Human Rights. It's very important, and it was important for us to stay as close as possible to the language of the conventions, uh, while, like I said, interpreting in a way that uh, makes sense for a general public. But since most um, countries are signatories to these international conventions, they've already agreed to follow them. So for us, it's just a different way of presenting the information um, and ensuring that people understand how those specific rights apply in pregnancy, in childbirth, in the postpartum period. In a way, we're not proposing anything new here. Um, these are very, very well accepted human rights standards. I'd like to focus a little bit more on, on one particular right, uh, which is a significant, um, plays a significant part in step one, and that's informed consent. Uh, one very good definition of informed consent is uh, present in the European Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine. And in Article 5, informed consent is defined um, in the following way. It's an intervention in the health, an intervention in the health field may only be carried out after the person concerned is given free and informed consent to it. This person shall beforehand be given appropriate information as to the purpose and nature of the intervention, as well as on its consequences and risks. The person concerned may freely withdraw consent at any time. So as you can see, there are three main elements of informed consent. It needs to be prior, so before anything is done. It needs to be freely given, no coercion, uh, and it needs to be informed, <laughs> as, the, as the title suggests. And, and informed means several things. Um, you need to explain as a provider, you need to explain what you're proposing, what's the purpose of the intervention, the potential benefits, the risks, the alternatives. 
and also suggested nothing can be done, as well as explained that the person can fr freely refuse, or even if they agree, they can at any time change their mind. So this is the, the principle of informed consent. I'd like to, to talk about informed consent as a, really a process of establishing trust between a provider and a, and a client. And that is a process that needs to happen well in advance of any emergency. So there's time, there's an opportunity and, and really freedom to discuss and answer any questions. What informed consent is not, is not a document signed. The signing of a document comes after that process is, is well established. Um, but by itself, uh, a signed document entitled informed consent does not mean that informed consent was actually uh, asked for or received. One example of how women themselves are approaching informed consent and how um, uh, providers may think of it too is uh, an acronym uh, that uh, doulas in the United States use, and that's the acronym BRAIN. So BRAIN stands for benefits, risks, alternatives, instincts, and nothing. And this is how um, women are are being prepared, you know, to ask questions, the types of questions uh, they will ask of a provider to ensure that they receive um, information, as much information as necessary to make up their own mind and make a decision. Um, so benefits, what are the benefits of doing this procedure, receiving this treatment or taking this medication? These are some of the questions they might be asking or what are the risks involved? Is there something else we could try? And then, you know, asking themselves, what is my gut telling me? Do I want to do this? Uh, and what if nothing happens? What if we do nothing? Or if we wait, what will happen then? So these are some questions you might expect as a provider, um, as women are ensuring that they can receive all of the information necessary for their own decision-making. At the end of the day, it has to be their decision. It's, it is their body. So you as a professional can provide the information that you have at your disposal and, and with your training and experience, uh, but the decision needs to be uh, made by the woman um, based on her individual circumstances. The step one indicators, so I'll talk through them and give specific examples, but there are five indicators. Uh, the first one is feedback mechanisms are provided for addressing complaints, such as, for example, a complaint box. And there has to be a grievance process defined and available to mothers and their families. The charter that I already um, showed you and talked about should be displayed. Local observers with disrespectful treatment, this is a very important indicator. And then women's questionnaires and our interviews show compliance with this step. I'll give an example on how this step one was uh, implemented by the government of India. Um, there's several programs that the government of India has launched in the past year uh, that are quite significant in terms of uh, implementing step one and just in general respectful um, and dignified care in healthcare facilities. Um, the LAKSHA initiative uh, is really a, a, a kind of a national initiative to ensure quality of care for maternal and newborn uh, health in labor room uh, and, and other facilities. So these are all um, public health facilities in India. And respectful care is one of the three pillars of the LAKSHA initiative. As uh, part of the program, the RMC charter is uh, displayed in participating healthcare facilities. It's really for, um, for us, this is, as WRA, that this was an opportunity to um, bridge the divide between theory of, and praxis of respectful maternity care uh, through ensuring that respectful care, the charter, the language of the charter are um, used as mechanisms to codify women's rights in childbirth. And um, we wanted also to ensure that there are practical examples from India that are used to inform the initiative because very often evidence from outside of the country would, would not be viewed with the same, uh, would not be given the same weight. 
Um, so that, that was quite significant for, for us. Um, the, the potential reach of this initiative, like I said, this is um, public health care facilities in India. So the potential reach is enormous. And so the opportunity here uh, to ensure respectful care for women and girls in India is, is really quite significant. This is just one, um, one of the aspects of, of, of how the government of India has approached respectful care, because the next initiative that I'd like to acknowledge, the Suman Initiative, provides then an additional aspect that focuses on accountability. Uh, so the Suman guidelines um, aim to create a responsive healthcare system which strives to achieve zero maternal infant deaths through quality care provided with dignity and respect. And, and the guidelines say that all pregnant women and infants visiting Suman designated public health facilities are entitled to the following free services, respectful care with privacy and dignity being one of them. So the Again, the focus on um, affordability is a big one here. Respectful care should not be something that is just available to the rich that you can only get if you pay extra. It, it really should be available to everybody. And as part of that um, then promise, the Suman guidelines set up a redress mechanism so women can report this respectful care. And this is quite significant. Um, so it's not only the, the uh, you know, displaying the charter or training providers under Laksha, but what's really important is that ensuring, as step one indicates, ensuring that there is a redress mechanism through which women can give feedback and continuously and constantly inform the system so the system becomes better because this is a process, right? It doesn't happen right away, but constantly women need to provide feedback, providers, administrators, other receive the feedback and do a little bit better every single time. Uh, as, part of, as part of that SUMAN initiative, uh, centers of excellence will be set up with the following responsibilities. Um, they will uh, focus on orientation, training and supporting service providers for creating a mother-friendly environment at facilities to provide safe delivery and respectful maternity care. They will be creating an ideal demonstration model for training and counseling um, to train all service providers on quality, antenatal, postnatal, uh, safe delivery and respectful maternity care. And they'll uh, generate actions to support changes in provider behavioral, uh, clinical environments, health systems to ensure that all women have access to respectful, competent and caring maternity health care services. Um, so we are very excited about this, this initiative and looking forward to seeing how the government of India implements uh, the initiative and ultimately what women have to say about that, how they uh, benefit from it. Step one is um, interdependent with so many of the other steps that uh, it's hard for me to, to highlight all of them, but I will focus on just a few. Uh, here and um, highlight how, how they uh, highlight the interplay between them. Uh, step two, for example, uh, focuses on free services. Um, and like I just mentioned, if respect and dignity are not provided freely, really step one cannot be achieved uh, for everybody. Uh, and honestly, I think cannot be achieved for anyone. Um, there will be no equity uh, if women need to, to pay for basic human rights. Uh, step three, which focuses on midwifery care, it, it's really interesting that, um, you know, as part of, of the government of India's initiative, there's, there's another program that focuses on preparing midwives, uh, or in this case, it's nurse practitioners in midwifery to enter the workforce and fill the gap of providing respectful care to women and newborns. So I think also just an example of how important midwifery is to ensure that respectful care is realized. Uh, step four focuses on continuous support and companion of choice. Again, really critical to ensuring step one, respect and dignity. If um, there's no opportunity for um, a companion of choice, if there's no opportunity to get that support, uh, again, step one will be compromised. Uh, the Laksha initiative that I previously referenced actually guarantees companion of care as well as continuous support during the labor 
uh, and delivery process. So, so this would be um, quite important to see how it works in practice, because we know from research that companion of care and continuous support are associated with higher satisfaction amongst women. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention step 10, respectful and positive work environment. As a provider, you cannot give what you don't have. And respectful care is only possible when staff themselves are respected and enabled to provide respectful and dignified care. So ensuring respectful and positive work environment are really paramount to ensure respectful care for women. My take home messages, um, if I can focus just on a few is, is really respectful care is what women want. This is really driven by consumers, by the clients. It's based on universally accepted human rights. Every single one of us has those rights and um, we, none of us can enjoy them if, if there are people um, amongst us who do not have those rights um, and those rights are not respected. So it's really paramount uh, to ensure that those rights are respected. And then we need political commitments to guarantee respect and dignity. Um, and that commitment could be at different levels, at the facility level, um, at, uh, you know, at regional level, at national level, at global level, but it's really critical to have that to ensure that we have changes in the way we deliver care for women. And those changes um, really are at a scale where it makes a difference for everybody. I do want to acknowledge in this presentation the many, many, many women and girls who have shared their powerful voices to demand respect and dignity in reproductive maternal and neonatal care. The women have spoken and now it's up to us to act upon this and acknowledge their demands and, and meet them where they are. And I'll leave you with a list of resources here um, to supplement your exploration of respect and dignity. If you go to the White Ribbon Alliance website slash RMCU resources, you'll see all of this listed. We do have uh, other translations forthcoming in different languages. And if you don't see a translation into your language, but are willing to uh, supplement a translation, please let us know. We want to make sure that all of those resources are available in any language in which they're needed. Uh, I'd like to um, highlight just a few of the resources. The podcast is something new that we just started last year. And it examines each of the individual rights of the RMC Charter in more detail. Um, so I would highly recommend that you start there. It's a very, very easy way to dive into more um, detail on the RMC Charter, hear from women directly, and hear from experts who specialize in each of the individual rights listed. Next slide, please. And here's a list of the, all of the resources I mentioned during the presentation in case you're interested or that might be helpful to your work. Thank you so much. I've left my email here. If you would like to get in touch with me, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate uh, to write me an email and I will be more than happy to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was such a Fantastic presentation. I think you you packed a lot of information in there for everyone. And I think the um, hearing about the What Women Want campaign is very relevant for the ICI sites, especially in thinking about um, the ICI questionnaires, because each of the facilities is asked to administer questionnaires to a sample of their the women giving birth in order to hear their feedback about how their perception of the respectful care or you know, their sort of a scaled feedback of how respectful or disrespectful they felt the care was so that the facility can really get a good barometer of you know, how their, their care is being perceived by both the women and also their companions who are accompanying them. So I think it's really nice to hear about the What Women Want campaign to really get everyone thinking about you know, what that looks like, what hearing women's voices really looks like.
That's, I think this is so important, Michelle, because we, we actually heard from many providers who don't have the benefit of receiving that kind of feedback, direct feedback from women um, who need that. They actually want, providers mostly want to hear how they're doing. And when that doesn't exist, you work in a vacuum. So you, you might think you're providing the best care that you can provide, uh, but you don't know if you're missing a mark. Uh, and respectful care is, is uh, so um, culturally um, dependent that it differs. If, even if you think of a definition of respectful care that might be applicable in one country, it might not be the same in another country um, because of cultural differences, uh, geographic, and any type of differences. So it's really about listening to the women you yourself are, are serving and how are you doing. And, for any individual, it's so important to receive feedback because this is the only way we learn and grow and improve in our profession that I see it as an immense opportunity for any facility or any provider. I, I agree with you completely. Um, so I wanna just ask you a few questions to follow up on your presentation. Uh, the first question is one that we are giving to all of our presenters, uh, which is really as the our partners are looking at the 12 steps and thinking about where they want to begin. Uh, what would you say to someone who was considering uh, whether or not they should tackle step one and, and what should they sort of keep in mind in, as they're assessing this? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, yeah, it's very tempting to say, of course, it's step one. <laughs> and it is such a basic, well, like I said, respect and dignity. Dignity, when you uh, think about it, it's, it's such a fundamental part of our humanity. It's actually the first sentence of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? Our inherent um, dignity and humanity. So it's it's uh, really fundamental to, to everything you might be building um, to start with, with this step and to set the tone and set the stage for what is to come. Uh, within step one, Personally, I think informed consent is, is really kind of the critical um, step to, to implement. Um, and it is a, a, a journey. It's, it's not, you know, it's not something that will happen within a day or two. Um, but like I said, if you like imagine if you're building a house and, and this is really the foundation, I think once you set that foundation to be stable and you're sure of it, then you're so much more successful in building, building up from there. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, I was thinking also, as I was listening to your review of all the different um, charters and, and documents, you know, listing the rights that everyone has, um, I wonder, you know, it happens in many cases that in some countries, our providers are running up into the obstacle where the laws are not in line with aspects of the 12 steps, or they're not in line with some of these universal uh, declarations. Um, would you have some, you know, we definitely say that we would want them, you know, in those cases to reach out to ICI as one resource to notify us if they find that there's a practice they want to implement in their facility, but it is not in line with the, with the local laws so that we're aware of it and we can try to um, identify partners and strategies. Um, but do you have any feedback um, from the White Ribbon Alliance for what you know what you would advise in those situations. Yes, absolutely. We we have actually um, been quite successful in bringing local human rights experts on board um, because very often it is actually the local legislation that's not in line with international commitments the same country has made, or there is sometimes misunderstanding what the local legislation requires. Um, so it's useful to have a local uh, expert who is well versed in, into the, uh, the legal environment and, and the legislation, the, both the local legislation, but also the international human rights um, laws and, and instruments, and, and can actually provide more clarity on that. Um, this has been our experience in Nigeria, for example, where providers were convinced that you have to detain a woman to ensure payment. And it is illegal as it is in, in all countries, um, but there was no clarity. Um, so it, it's a process that everybody thought was legal <laughs> when in fact it is not. So it wasn't the international convention was any different. 
it was just a misunderstanding of, of what it entails. Mm -hmm. um, but very, very useful to have an expert on board to provide this type of advice. And if, um, if any site does not have that type of connection, we're happy also to provide um, information and advice when we can or connect with, with uh, other organizations in the country who might be helpful. Right. That actually was going to be my next question was, you know, is there an easy way for them to, to look for contact information for a local White Ribbon Alliance, um, you know, branch, or should they contact you centrally to get, um, to get referred? What's the best way for them to get, in, to find their nearest um, WRA office? Uh, so both are listed on the website. Uh, both colleagues, right, uh, who work in individual countries will be listed as well as, as uh, information how to contact them. As well as if, if there's no uh, representation from the White Tribune Alliance in a particular country, they're more than welcome to contact us uh, centrally here in Washington, D.C. Okay. And the White Tribune is not just the, right, it's not just the, the organizations that are listed. We have such a vast network of other stakeholders, partners. Um, so we can most probably connect you to the best, best partner in the country or, or those who can provide that advice. Fantastic. I think that that's really wonderful. And we're really grateful for that partnership because I think it is, it is critical um, to have that, that advocacy component because we really need that. We need you know, this global support and we need this full system um, to function for, for us to achieve our goals. So we're very grateful. Absolutely. Any support we can provide to colleagues working at facility level, we recognize how hard their work is. Um, and they should specialize in what they do, right? Providing care. So any, anything else that we can provide that where we're good at, uh, we're more than happy to. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think that's definitely a message we want to share that we, we really, you know, ICI as well, we really welcome anyone to reach out to us and we'll try to link them to you or to any other partners um, on the ground or, you know, brainstorm for ways around it. Because I think also the providers, as providers, there's a lot of fatigue and sometimes you're just so in it that it's hard to, you know, to take that pause, but we really want to be there to um, encourage them not to feel frustrated. So if anyone's feeling frustrated running up against an obstacle to please reach out to us, to reach out to you, um, and that we're hoping to really, you know, together we're really going to make change. So I want to thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. I want to thank all of our listeners. Um, please continue to watch the rest of the 12 step series. And also, you know, feel free to reach out to either of us. And as well, we have a forum that will be open so they can also um, put questions there and we can um, put you in touch with that as well, Elena. Absolutely, more than happy to. Looking forward to the engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle.